as we discussed, um, I'm going to be talking to you tonight about caring for your senior pet. Uh, as Michelle explained, I am a resident in canine sports medicine and rehabilitation. I often find that that's not something many people know what that means. So um, before I get into our topic tonight, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on why I am able to talk to you about this and what exactly um, a resident means. So I did vet school, like most other people, I did uh, four years of vet school. And then after vet school, I did an internship. Um, so that's an extra year of training in pretty much all fields of medicine. So emergency and in uh, surgery, uh, medicine, those kinds of things. And most people do that either to prepare them better to go out in general practice, or in my case, to go into specialty medicine. And so just like in people, we have specialists who basically spend an additional three years on top of their uh, um, vet school to focus just on a specific topic. And my specific topic that I'm studying is sports medicine and rehabilitation. And even though that's a specialty, it's actually pretty broad. So we cover everything from um, medical management of orthopedic disease, meaning non-surgical management of orthopedic disease, or uh, non-surgical management of neurological diseases, and then also a good portion of our, our patients are sporting dogs, so agility dogs, and then also we have um, our geriatric patients, which actually is a big part of our um, caseload at the AMC. Um, I might have shared the wrong screen. Hold on, this one's not advancing. Let's try this one. From the beginning, we'll see if that, there we go. Um, I also wanted to just give you a little bit of background on my experience with rehab. These are some old pictures of the very first time I ever worked with rehab. Um, so John Sherman, who's the, the main vet um, in that top photo, was one of the first people to ever practice uh, physical therapy. So that's a protected term. We're not allowed to use that term in veterinary medicine, so we call it rehabilitation. Um, so he was the first one of two rehabilitation practitioners in the day. Um, and that was the first time I ever fell in love with this field and knew that it was right for me. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, there was a little bit of a lag time between when I was a technician working in rehab and going to vet school. But the best part about that for me was that in that time, this developed into its own specialty. And so now we have our own college and training. And so um, it allowed me to be able to truly specialize. So that's a little bit of my background, and we'll get on to what we're going to talk about tonight. So obviously we're here to talk about senior pets. I'm going to explain to you that there's actually a difference between senior and geriatric pets. We'll talk about some of the illnesses you might see um, and some of the changes that happen in, their, in the body of a senior pet. One of the things that we talk about most often is osteoarthritis because that's certainly one of the most significant diseases that affects senior pets. We'll talk a little bit about nutrition and supplements, some of the pain medications we have available to help with pain. I'm gonna show you some fun exercises you can do with any of your pets, but great to do with your senior pet to keep them active. And then we'll talk a little bit about some things that you can do once they're not as mobile, when they can't walk on their own and how we can help them through that. So the golden retriever on this screen is my soulmate. Uh, soulmate dog who made it to his life expectancy. He passed away a few years ago. And I put him up here because uh, to remind me that he did make it to uh, his senior years. And so there is a difference between senior and geriatric. And it probably doesn't really matter for the purposes of this conversation. Um, in general, I'm just going to refer to everything as senior. It changes what I do a little bit as a practitioner. Um, but for our purposes, it doesn't matter. So it's sort of academic. But for what it's worth, a senior dog is considered senior when they've reached kind of the last 25% of their expected lifespan. And a geriatric dog is when they've exceeded that lifespan. And that is dependent on somewhat on the age and the breed of the dog. And so, for example, our middle to large breed dogs have a different life expectancy than your, your kind of your Great Danes and the giant breeds versus your small dogs have a much longer life expectancy. So whether they're senior or geriatric could be dependent on the breed and, and um, the size of the dog. So in terms of what kind of illnesses and things we might see in dogs, 
As a general rule of thumb, when I look at an aging patient, just like in people, we presume that their heart and lungs are just not as effective as they used to be. The heart becomes a less efficient pump, uh, doesn't push the blood around as well. Even in the absence of evidence of disease, we know that that's a natural aging change. The lungs have decreased capacity, so they can't expand as much as they used to, and that affects a dog's exercise tolerance. We also know in some studies that were done in the sort of recent, uh, recently, that most dogs have decline in kidney functions. So your kidneys play an important role in regulating blood pressure, they regulate uh, how many red blood cells you have, and they also help eliminate toxins in the body. They might process some of the medications that your senior pet is on. And so we have some standardized testing that we do that, um, that we do on older pets to kind of monitor that. But we're finding that that's not as sensitive for some of our older dogs and that some of those dogs, when we look at different ways of evaluating their kidney function, even without evidence on normal blood work or in um, physical signs, they have some decrease in kidney function. That's important for me if I'm going to pre prescribe medications to your pet because I might want to alter how much of that medication or if that medication is safe at all if, if I think even in the face of normal blood work they might have a little bit of kidney deficiency. We also see patients, most commonly, um, these are the types of endocrine or hormonal diseases that we see. So hypothyroidism in dogs often um, that happens as they age. You'll see them kind of have this you know, weight gain, decreased activity, they might have a poor hair coat. Um, we can see hyperthyroidism in cats. Often that is the opposite. Um, people will report that their cat is suddenly have a new lease on life and it's running around, it's more active. And that's because actually they have too much of that thyroid um, hormone that's stimulating their metabolism and stimulating their activity. And so usually when an older cat who used to live kind of a sedentary life and we hear, oh, suddenly they're running around, they're talking at night, it's kind of a red flag. And then Cushing's, which is a disease process of either your adrenal glands or which are your stress hormone glands. Those are things that squeeze when you slam on the brakes to avoid hitting a red light or the car in front of you. Um, and then also it's regulated by the pituitary gland. And so those are responsible for secreting cortisol, your stress hormone. And dogs can get benign tumors, but functional tumors that cause them to excrete too much. And oftentimes they will have this kind of pot-bellied appearance. They'll They'll have um, loss of hair coat. They might have some changes in their ligaments and their muscles become kind of poor tone. And those are kind of the big things that affect what I do in terms of mobility. So um, that's why I choose to mention them here. Obviously, the nervous system can also have aging changes. Um, your spine is full of joints, just like the rest of your um, body. So just like your knees or your elbows, your spine is full of multiple little joints between each all of those vertebrae. And they can have arthritis and degenerative changes just like the other part of your um, joints. You can have intervertebral disc disease, which isn't always isolated to aging, but the discs and the cushions uh, between the spine um, can, can degenerate, become less um, can become dehydrated, can cause a little bit of compression and pain. Um, so that's something we look for. Dogs can also get something we call sort of a peripheral neuropathy that's age related, can either be related in labs, if you've ever heard the term laryngeal paralysis. So that's kind of this long nerve that helps your vocal cords open and shut. Dogs, Labradors are very predisposed to this. They can have this kind of um, raspy um, voice. They can become intolerant of heat. Um, and that same process we think also helps or uh, affects what we call the long nerve tract. So the nerves that go to your feet tend to sort of just age. And so that signal's not as good. And so you might have some weakness in your hind limbs. Dogs can also experience canine cognitive dysfunction. This can be a real tough one to manage. Usually uh, presents similarly to um, anxiety. It's just that that anxiety seems to be unwarranted. So it's an isolated, sometimes it's cyclical, same time every day. We think that this is fairly similar to human Alzheimer's um, where there's atrophy of the brain. And so dogs tend to be anxious. They might start having accidents in the house. Um, and as it progresses, it can get really bad where they get kind of stuck in a corner and they don't know how to get out of it. So those are some of the nervous system changes that you might see in an aging pet. The big one and the one that I'll probably spend the most time on um, is osteoarthritis. And I spend a lot of time on this because it's fairly common and also because it's something I am pretty passionate about treating, but also because I think it's one of those things that can seem kind of scary to owners, um, but it's actually very treatable and manageable. 
And we actually, I'm lucky to be practicing at a time when, um, you know, this is not something that people euthanize their pets for anymore. It used to be very much that when dog couldn't walk anymore, that was it. Um, but now it's a very manageable thing. It does have a significant impact on senior pets. It, the reason it has that effect is it affects their ability to do sort of their activities of daily living. So things like posturing to defecate or to urinate, things like standing at their food bowl, um, getting up out of their bed, going for walks. Usually what you're gonna see at home is some stiffness, maybe decreased mobility, reluctance to do stairs. The downside of osteoarthritis, which normally you'll hear, you know, arthritis is the common term, is that it is progressive and we don't have a cure for it, but we do have a lot of ways to manage it. We know that it is common in cats as well. We used to, I think it was an underappreciated thing that happened to cats, but now we know it's much more common. There were some studies done through NC State and some other um, institutes that looked at um, the evidence of arthritis on x-rays. And they found that even young dogs had, or young cats even had evidence of arthritis, um, but that it was more common and, and more uh, progressive uh, uh, when, when they were aged. The one thing that I always tell people when we tell our clients and we have to remind ourselves as clinicians sometimes is that we have to treat the patient and not the x-ray. So just because there's evidence of arthritis um, on the x-ray doesn't mean that the cat is really experiencing discomfort or pain from it. So we always wanna do a physical exam and confirm that they're actually having symptoms. So how do we um, treat osteoarthritis. I could, I could pause for a moment if there's questions right now and, and if there's anything people were, there's a lot of information. There are, there are a lot of questions about osteoarthritis. Um, so I'm thinking maybe let's keep going. I'm making sure. notes of them, but I, I um, see things that I know are coming up in your presentation. Great. So we'll hold All on. right. So we'll continue um, and talk about osteoarthritis and how do we treat it? Well, I've done a tiered, uh, uh, flow, flow sheet or flow diagram here for you um, in order of what I think is most important. And I will, we will also add to that, that one thing that as a specialist, I really pride myself on doing is trying to practice what we call evidence-based medicine. So using um, research, pro research studies and the literature to really guide my recommendations. Uh, and so this is also based on what we've seen in the literature, what the research has shown us. And so when I speak to folks about managing arthritis, the two most important things that I tell them that you can do is diet and weight loss and exercise. And often, you know, I have a lot of tools in my toolbox that can help with arthritis. Some of them are very expensive. Some of them are very easy and not everybody can do all of them. But I usually say, and this is 100% true, if you can do those first two things, you're going to do great. Even if you can't do any supplements or, you know, any of the other things we can do to help reduce arthritis, if you can keep your dog at the lean body weight and keep them mobile, those things are going to really significantly impact their life and reduce the progression of arthritis. The other things that I have in my toolbox are pain management, things like anti-inflammatories. We use a lot of supplements, and then we also have what we call adjunctive therapies, um, so things like joint injections and regenerative medicine. So this is um, one of the things that I have actually heard um, in the clinic. People will tell me, I like to do myth busters. You know, people will say, well, my dog's old, so it's kind of normal. They're just, they've gained weight because they're old. Well, that's true. What happens to all of us, even in dogs and people, our metabolism slows down, um, but that's not normal. So that may be an expected change that their metabolism slows down, but it's not normal. So we still want to keep our senior pets nice and lean and in good shape. The other thing that happens to our senior pets, which is something that we've only recently really started investigating in veterinary medicine, it's been pretty well established in human medicine for a long time, is something called sarcopenia. And sarcopenia is the word we use to describe age-related muscle loss in the absence of disease. So what that means is certainly you might have seen your own pets or family members who have had chronic illness. And a lot of times they'll have poor muscle mass associated with that. And that's because the illness is actually taking more nutrients than their muscles and their body is. In sarcopenia, we have this muscle loss and we don't really have a good reason for it other than it happens in older patients and it happens in older dogs. So it's not necessarily associated with a disease process. It's sort of a expected age-related change. And what's happening is they're having an increase in their fat mass, ma mass and a decrease in their lean body mass. And it can be a significant um, 
a, a cause of mortality um, because it does cause weakness and um, can also cause the muscle tendons to be um, poorly uh, built. And so they have sort of incoordination, they can have a wobbly gait. Um, so it is something that we think about when we're treating, especially in rehabilitation medicine, when we're treating our older pets. So the other thing about weight loss um, is that tissue, the fat tissue itself, the adipose, it's called adipose, is actually inflammatory. So arthritis is an inflammatory process, um, meaning there's inflammation and certain um, mediators in the body or certain factors that are in the body that cause inflammation. Inflammation is usually painful, can cause heat and swelling. And so adipose tissue we discovered in the last 10 years is actually pro-inflammatory. So in addition to the fact that being overweight adds strain to your joints, it, uh, and it contributes to exercise intolerance, makes dogs more reluctant to exercise, it's pro-inflammatory. So that's another reason to um, make sure your pets stay lean. And these things all sort of go together. So, you know, we worry about the age-related muscle loss. We worry about the pro-inflammatory adipose tissue, and we worry about weight gain and the effect of that on overall mobility. And it's also, because if a dog is less active, going to make the arthritis worse. So that kind of all plays together and is an important role in managing this particular disease process. So I just wanted to, many of you may have already seen these before. There's a couple of what we call body condition scores out there. People often ask me how much should my dog weigh? And that really is dependent on a lot of things. It's dependent on its muscle mass. It's dependent on its breed. Um, and so the easier way for me to explain that is to go through body conditioning scoring. Um, Purina has this, there's um, Royal Canin, this is from Royal Canin website, um, but basically it allows us to score a dog and we look for how they look physically. So can I see a tuck under their um, ribs? When I look over the top of them, is there a tuck behind their ribs? Um, when I palpate when I, or feel along their rib cage, can I easily feel those ribs or am I um, pressing in really hard to feel them? And so those are all things that I use to decide if your dog is overweight and it helps it give sort of a number, something that I can monitor over time. Um, this is a great picture. This is a field trial dog, so um, obviously very well in shape. Um, it's a black dog, so you may not see as well, but the yellow line is there to show you that there's a really nice tuck um, from the side. And if, excuse me, if you were to look at this dog from the top, you would actually see a nice tuck after his rib. You can actually see, and I don't know if you can see my point, you can see this dog's last rib. Um, this is obviously a very fit athletic dog, um, but this is actually okay. Um, you don't have to worry if you see that last rib. That is actually puts them in, an, in a normal um, weight weight or body condition score. I usually tell people that when folks stop you on the street to tell you that your dog is too thin, that's how you know that they are thin enough because we all have a very kind of false sense of what dogs are supposed to look like. We can do the same thing in cats. It's a little bit different um, because cats tend to have sort of a fat pad on their belly, even if they've lost weight. So if you've ever had an overweight cat and been successful in helping them lose weight, that little um, fat pouch in their belly can be misleading. But we do the same thing with them, looking at um, how much fat is over their rib cage. Do they have a nice tuck? Um, really looking for, you know, this this actually says four to five is is or four is too thin. For my patients, I actually like the metaphor because most of my patients have arthritis, and so I like them to be nice and lean for all the reasons we kind of just already reviewed. And then the other part that we pay attention to is a muscle score. And so uh, what we're doing is palpating the muscle thickness and looking to see how much muscle wasting there is. And it's um, a little bit subjective. It's probably not as um, organized or validated as our, as our body condition score. Um, but we're essentially, you know, again, seeing how much compression there is when we're palpating the muscles. And this is something that we see in older um, cats and dogs, especially along their back. That's a really great place to identify it. You'll start to see that there's spine is really um, bony. So that's kind of my, my soapbox about nutrition or about uh, weight. Um, and so how do we make sure that they're having appropriate nutrition? Um, well, one thing is that we know that as a dog ages, it has about a 25% reduction in energy requirements of dogs. Um, and so we want to make sure, and, and also that lean body mass loss that they have affects their energy requirements. So we want to make sure we're accounting for that. A lot of the senior diets um, will account for that. So those are great options. We also want to recognize that they are have a higher 
higher need for dietary antioxidants um, and that their protein and fiber um, requirements change or proteins a little bit less and they need a little bit more fiber. So these are things to consider and things to bring up with your vet to make sure your dog's on an appropriate food. This is another one that I, I've definitely heard, you know, your dog or your pet is not showing any signs of illness, so they don't need to go to the vet. Well, we, we know that that's not true because a lot of things can get missed with not going to the vet. I actually recommend that your senior to geriatric pets get blood works um, and, and check their urine twice a year. And I don't think it's wrong to do some screening chest x-rays and ultrasound if you're able to do that on a regular basis as your pet gets or older. We don't have the same um, degree of screening things that we can do in our um, veterinary patients as they do in human medicine. And even that being said, our blood work, our routine blood work does have its limitations. So for example, the kidney has to have lost 75% of its function before we'll see anything on blood work. Um, so that physical exam goes a long way and, um, and checking in with your vet on a regular basis goes a long way for your senior pets. Um, do we want to stop and answer some questions or... Um, I think keep going. One more okay. section. Okay. All right. Um, so pain management. So um, this is something I hear commonly. So it's, it's something I like to help people be able to identify. So um, often people don't, don't associate a limping with, um, with pain. They associate with it just a dog being old. That's just how they move. And that actually is the number one sign of pain. And so I have a video of a dog limping that I'll share with you. Um, this is Tango. Tango um, actually had um, uh, a cruciate tear, but you can see that he is definitely limping. And this is in our rehab space where we, um, you can see it on the next one too, where he's coming towards. He actually has a back leg lameness and a front leg. You see that head bob? Um, so that head bob is very characteristic of a forelimb or front leg lameness. Um, and so that to me is the number one sign that a dog is in pain. So if you see your dog is limping, that's a pretty good indication that something is up. There are certainly cases when dogs have lameness for other reasons, but the most likely cause of lameness is going to be pain. So how do we treat that pain? The most common thing we use are anti-inflammatories. So if you've ever heard the term Rimadyl or Carprofen, um, uh, Paroxicam, Deramax, these are all common anti-inflammatories and they work to essentially reduce inflammation within the joint and that inflammation is causing pain. They're not without side effects. Rimadyl is um, the one we use most commonly. It's been used for, for many, many years and it's very, very safe, but it does have to be used judiciously and monitored. Um, gabapentin is something that we think works better uh, potentially on nerve root pain. So dogs who might have disc disease, you can use something like gabapentin. Um, it does work in a, in a different mechanism of action. Um, it has also been associated potentially with tr treating chronic pain. Most of the studies show that it's not really great at um, treating arthritis pain. Amantadine is actually an antiviral, was developed to be a flu medication, but we found that the mechanism of action works to um, reduce chronic pain and also works synergistically with your anti-inflammatories to get an even more robust response. We do use opioids to some extent, um, but really only for acute pain, so they're going to be less likely used in dogs who are managing chronic pain like osteoarthritis pain. Um, opioids have a very poor bioavailability, meaning you can take them orally in a dog, but they're just not getting into the bloodstream and getting to the area that we want them to. Um, they're really poorly absorbed uh, in dogs, and so they don't have a great function. And then we have supplements, and this is um, something that I use a lot to help manage uh, our osteoarthritis. Uh, glucosamine, this is myth buster number four. So glucosamine and chondroitin is a great supplement for my dog's arthritis. So many years ago, some people took glucosamine and chondroitin, they put it in a Petri dish and they showed that it helped improve the health of the, of the cartilage cells. We've yet to prove that that happens actually in your body, either in humans or in dogs. Uh, there's not very many studies in dogs and there's the studies that have been done in people just shows that it's really not beneficial. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of other things out there, but I bring this up because this is very common over-the-counter medication that people are able to get access to. Uh, in human medicine, when they evaluate sort of level of evidence, this is on the, uh, pretty low on the level of evidence to support this. So um, I just like people to know that, that there's just not a great amount of evidence for this particular supplement. And on that note, I always like to give people some help in how they pick a supplement. Of course, you should always uh, 
always reach out to your veterinarian. And if they don't feel comfortable, there are folks like me um, that can help you make a, rec make a decision. Uh, there's a couple of things that I like to tell people that I think is really important in how you pick this. The number one is that you can go to the National Animal Supplement Council and look and see if that particular product is on their list of approved, approved supplements. What that means is they have to have specific labels, they have to document quality control, the ingredients are reviewed by the NACS or NASC um, uh, organization and they do random product testing. So it's a way to know that you have third party evaluation of your supplement. So that's huge. A lot of these will have actually the NASC symbol on the bottle so that you can um, use that as a reference. Um, the other thing I'll say in terms of how to pick a supplement, there's two other things that I like to look for. One is, have they done a study to prove that it works and that it's safe? And there are, as you may know, no regulations of supplements. They're not FDA approved. So that's something they do voluntarily. So a company that is willing to look into whether it's safe, whether it's effective is huge for me. So that, that's important. The other thing I like, which I can't always have in veterinary medicine, is that it was tested in the species they're advertising advertising it for. So great, this worked in people, but we know that there are differences in how cats metabolize things and how dogs metabolize things and how people metabolize things. So it may not work in a dog or a cat, even if it worked in a human. And then the other thing I like to look for, which is probably less important, is that the company has been around for a period of time. So they have some longevity and some, um, you know, some reason that they've been around and are still able to produce products. We also have um, omega-3s actually, we know that they are hugely anti-inflammatory. They're sort of a natural NSAID or anti-inflammatory um, supplement. They do have uh, side effects as well if taken in, in too large quantities. Um, but in human medicine, we did a review recently uh, that actually showed that this is pretty low level of evidence. If you ask a uh, my human counterpart in human medicine, they really don't, they won't tell you not to take omega-3s, but the evidence is just not there. So when we always recommend omega-3s and we sort of took a step back and thought, well, why are we recommending it when in human medicine, they're just not seeing that it works. And when you look at the research that's been done in veterinary medicine, the majority of that research that showed that omega-3s were effective were actually done in diets that were in, that had extremely high levels of omega-3s. And so now I do prescribe over-the-counter supplements and I put a couple up here that I, I think are good um, you know, supplements outside of their food. But ideally with my patients, I try to get them on a joint protective diet that already has this high level of omega-3s in it uh, because I know that that's what's gonna be more effective for them. There are other supplements out there. Turmeric is a, a new uh, big one that people are really excited about. It generally has very poor availability, so you want to buy that with, um, you know, with caution. Uh, curcuin is the one that we typically recommend in our clinic. Um, that one, again, as I said, I can't always get what I want. There was some significant work done in human medicine, medicine that showed it was bioavailable, so I don't have an alternative for that in um, veterinary medicine. Um, but you know, that's one that we can use. Botswellia has also been shown to be a natural anti-inflammatory. Azastathin is a powerful antioxidant. Um, so these are some things out there. And again, just picking supplements that sort of fit that criteria and always talking to a veterinarian um, and not necessarily, you know, your local pet store rep or something like that. Not that they're not very knowledgeable, but, um, you know, these tend to be very expensive and you want to make sure that it's worth the money. Um, green shell mussels also uh, potentially have a, a better source of the high dose omega-3s, um, also anti-inflammatory, and, and they have a, a wide range of um, what we call bio bioactive lipids and antioxidants. And we think there may be actually other pathways of pain that they are helping with. Um, it does appear to be a, a dose dependent, meaning the higher the dose, the more effective. Um, and so there's a couple of products. Antinol is the one we use most commonly um, that has this uh, green shell mussel. And then of course the hot, hot thing these days is CBD oil. Um, again, buying an over-the-counter unregulated CBD, you just don't know what you're getting. There has been some studies. Uh, there were two, what we call prospective, meaning they were um, 
you know, not looking at what happened to a pet after they'd been on. They actively gave this uh, CBD oil and saw what the effect was. Um, clinical trials in veterinary medicine. The two products are Elevet and then another company, ABSC. Uh, and both of those have studies that shown that it's effective. Uh, in veterinary medicine, we think it's most effective in treating arthritis-related pain and also may uh, be beneficial in treating epilepsy. But again, um, this is, you know, a huge, a huge area that we need to do a lot more work in. And I just caution people to just buy something over the counter that's not regulated. There's no real um, way to know how much of the actual ingredient that is pain relieving is in that particular supplement. Um, so just knowing what the ones out there that have actually have oversight and have done research into what the dose is and, you know, is it effective. Um, some of the other therapies that can benefit your pet, um, Adequan is an injectable medication that is actually FDA approved. It's um, basically given a couple times a week for about a month and uh, can help improve the quality of the joint fluid and the cartilage and alleviate pain. So we use that quite frequent, frequently. Acupuncture is certainly great. I personally don't, I'm not trained in it, but I'm around uh, folks that are and I get to see the benefit of it all the time and it um, really can help geriatric patients for lots of reasons. Um, even geriatric patients that potentially are dealing with other health issues like um, cancer or um, other uh, chronic illness, uh, acupuncture can help with appetite, it can help improve energy, it has a really uh, wonderful um, therapy. And then, of course, um, rehabilitation, which technically really isn't an adjunctive therapy. It is, should probably be on a slide that says mainstay. Um, but rehabilitation is uh, something that is hugely valuable to our, um, our senior pets. I just had a, a, a patient today that I saw that um, mom was just, just made my day because she was telling me about how her dog, before she came to us, just wasn't even able to get up. And now she's chasing squirrels in the park and going on mile-long walks. So um, that's, you know, a amazing and makes my job wonderful and I'm so happy to be able to do that but we focus on getting dogs being mobile again and keeping them as mobile as possible. Um, another thing just uh, that I didn't include a slide on, but we do some regenerative medicine as well. So that's stem cell therapy, um, joint injections, things like that, which are certainly, um, you know, other alternatives that we can do for dogs or cats who are sort of refractory to some of the other things that we've talked about. So we have them on a joint protective diet, we've lost weight, um, we're keeping them mobile, um, and they still are su suffering. So we can do um, regenerative medicine and stem cells for them. And it's, um, it's pretty effective. So this is a big one. Um, I hear this all the time as a veterinarian. People say, your job must be so hard. You can't ask them, you know, if they're in pain, how do you find it? And so um, I think that this is, it's actually, uh, it makes me feel good that I must have this special skill, but it's actually not that hard um, if you know what to look for. And so hopefully at the end of this chat, uh, you'll feel more comfortable knowing what to look for if your pain is in, in or if your pet is in pain. So one of the big things um, that, that can be affected uh, if a pet is in pain is their drinking and eating habits. Now that is sort of a very non-specific thing. There's a lot of things that ca can cause an animal to have a decreased appetite or thirst, um, but that, that's something to pay attention to. Um, the other thing I will say is a lot of times these things happen subtly. So our pets are really good at compensating for a long time. So you may not notice subtle changes and then all of a sudden you're like, oh wow, things have really significantly changed. So tuning into these things early on can be helpful. Um, you can also notice change in sleeping habits. So um, maybe they're restless, maybe they're not staying in the same bed, maybe they used to jump up on the bed with you and now they're sleeping on the floor. Um, being more vocal can be a sign of pain, um, sort of when they go to lie down, if they have a little gruff or when they get up, they're doing a little grunt. Um, decreased energy, reluctance to do activity. Um, cats particularly will be very guarded and antisocial and they may even become uh, aggressive. Another one that you might um, not notice right away would be excessive grooming. So a dog that's really licking their paws. My, um, my dog used to have arthritis in his wrists and he would obsessively lick at his wrists. Um, panting can be a sign or increased respiratory rate can be a sign of, of pain. Certainly limping as we talked about, stiffness or difficulty rising. Changes in body posture is a big one. And I have this slide for you to kind of see. Um, I don't know if you, if you just looked at Bubba, if you would notice that he was standing differently 
family. But when you compare him to his four-year-old counterpart, Rex, you can really see that Bubba's uh, legs are tucked underneath him and that's a way for him to try and take weight off of his back legs. His, his back end is really rounded. You can even see in his front legs that his elbows are further back behind him. Um, again, ways to offload weight. Um, his, his spine is not straight, so it should be nice and straight. You can see that in Rex. It's not in Bubba. So that all, all of those things now, Again, Golden Retrievers happen to be one of my favorite dogs for this very reason. The look on both of these dogs' face is exactly the same. They're smiling, they're happy, um, they're looking at their at their handler or their owner. Um, but the one, but Bubba is significantly uncomfortable and has changed his posture to accommodate that. And the last thing I'll note too, you can see it in their tail. So Rex has this nice um, tail out up and behind him and Bubba's is just tucked underneath. And so all of those are things that you can look for uh, in your aging pet. Cats also, um, cats are really good at hiding pain. Um, and so they may not always show you. These are three very different um, pictures. So obviously these beautiful cats that are stretching out and um, you know playing, those cats are not in pain. And this cat, this poor black and white cat, um, he's got his head hung, he's got sort of an unkept uh, coat. Um, again, the body posture, notice how he's moved his, his limbs underneath him to offload weight and kind of change his center of gravity. Um, so those are kind of things that you can look for in a cat. A cat that is in pain is not gonna stretch out and do this lovely downward facing dog or, um, you know, happy baby that this other little um, cat is doing. So then the fun part, and this is sort of bringing us full circles, you know, how do you exercise your dog and your senior pet? Um, and how do you maintain mobility? And if you remember when we first started talking, uh, the two most important things I said, one was weight loss and the other is exercise. We know that not moving is actually worse for your joints than moving. It can be really hard to break that cycle in an old dog who doesn't want to get up or a cat who doesn't want to get up because they're in pain. But if we don't get them moving, they're just going to become more in pain, gain weight, and so the cycle continues. So how how do we do this? Um, and again, this sort of what I was just saying, um, you know, we think that dogs who are in pain and have arthritis should not be exercised. It's actually the opposite. Now, we don't want to do too much. I often joke about weekend warrior syndrome, where, you know, we work maybe not right now, we're all working from home. Um, but pre-COVID, when you work Monday through Friday, you have long days and you can't take your dog out. And then on Saturday, you go to the park or the beach or the pond for like six hours and then your dog can't walk for three days. So there is a balance between too much and too little. And so that kind of ties into wanting regular, frequent, low, at, low impact exercise. There's been some studies that look at, you know, kind of how much and how frequently. So several walks a day up to 30 minutes is great. Once you get past 30 minutes, if the arthritis is pretty severe, that can be really challenging. Um, you often want to avoid activities that cause them to really twist or turn. Um, you know, for example, ball retrieves, if they're, you know, going crazy to check, you know, maybe it bounces off a tree and they twist and turn and come back. Those kinds of activities can be really inflammatory. Inflammatory. That being said, I'm also a sucker for um, dogs doing things that make make them happy. And so if you came to me as my client, you said my dog loves throwing the ball more than anything and he doesn't want to just follow it, you know, roll it on the ground. Um, I would say, okay, so we can do that three times a week you know, throw the ball four times and that's it. So we don't have to take things away. We just modify to accommodate what makes that dog happy, what supports your bond with your pet um, without making them too uh, sore. And then the other thing that we never really think about with our veterinary patients um, is that they need to warm up and cool down too. So just like you wouldn't go from your couch to running a 5K, you do some stretching, you do some plyometrics, get your body warmed up. Um, you have to do the same thing with your dog. So that dog that loves to chase the ball should not go from lying on its bed to chasing the ball. We should take a nice 10 minute walk to the park and then chase the ball so the muscles are warmed up and they're ready to go. And then the walk back can be nice and slow and easy till he kind of gets back to his normal breathing and that's your cool down. Um, the other thing that we focus on with our senior pets a lot is, you know, what things do they have to do to be able to live and function in their home? So as we kind of mentioned in the beginning, they have to be able to posture to urinate and defecate. That's a huge one. Uh, for cats, they have to be able to get in and out of the litter box. Uh, they have to be able to rise to get their, to get their food and water bowls, especially water. Um, and then a lot, of, a lot of dogs have to be able to do stairs. 
And so what are exercises that we can do that help, uh, help you continue to be able to do these activities? Uh, so there's a few and I'll show you in videos what we can do. So these are some of the most common that I do. Um, sit to stands, which is kind of like a doggy squat, walking over low level objects and then push ups. And then also um, we call these isometrics. So it's kind of like yoga for dogs. These are when they're holding a posture. For example, if you wanted to do something like an elevated stand um, or a three-legged stand. So holding postures can be really challenging. If any of you have ever done yoga, it seems like you're not really asking this dog to do a lot, but if you're holding a yoga pose, you know, you're breathing through it to hold it for as long as you're supposed to. Um, so those can be really challenging. This is an example of a sit to stand. Um, so what we're doing here is asking him to sit and asking him to immediately rise. Um, and he is struggling with this a little bit. This dog has a little bit of lower back pain. You can see he's got a little bit of a wide base stance there. Um, but this activity is a very functional activity. Um, and it's the repetition of it that we have them do to sort of build muscles. Uh, so you can see that, you know, he's, he's doing what I call a squat and, um, and then standing up. And so uh, again, we repeat that uh, exercise to build their quads um, and keep this as an activity. This is a common reporting um, uh, abnormality that we get from our senior, uh, senior pet owners. My dog can't sit down. He has trouble getting into a seated posture. And if they have trouble doing this, you can actually make it easier by putting something underneath them like a couch cushion. So if they can only get partially the way down, you can put a couch cushion underneath them so he doesn't have to go all the way to the ground. Um, this is a doggy push-up. Um, so essentially this is great for forelimbs, uh, keeping their forelimbs uh, strong. You can see this dog is very intent on the treat. Um, and you will see that he is in a seated position and, and then he goes down and goes back up and goes down and goes back up. And so that is essentially what you're looking for. Um, helps strengthen the front limbs, it helps improve range of motion in the joints, um, and is a really easy exercise. And these exercises can be done with any pet um, at any age, but they're really great for your senior pets. Because again, those are things he has to do, he has to be able to get up from his bed. This is a fancy setup of something we call Cavalettis, but you can really use anything in your home. Um, you can use broom handles, broomsticks, a rake. Um, you can go buy Cavalettis. Um, this is a great exercise for dogs who um, we wanna increase their range of motion. So make them bend their legs a little bit more and also make them aware, more aware of where their feet are. So this is for those dogs that have potentially um, that uh, neuropathy I was talking about. So their sense, their signal to their legs is maybe not as good as it used to be. So we have them do stuff like this. This is um, much harder. <laughs> this is my own dog and um, she's not very good at this exercise. It was really hard to teach her, um, but this is called sidestepping. And so this is really good. It kind of ties in all the things we're talking about. So it's good for their proprioception and also their muscles. Um, and she, what I'm basically doing here is I have a treat in front of her nose and I'm just kind of guiding her to walk sideways. She didn't do terribly, but um, you can see it's pretty challenging for her. Um, it can be tough, tough to teach, teach this one, um, especially to an older dog, um, but it's a good, good thing to do. Um, and then what do we do for our cats? So I think, uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, rehab isn't for cats, but that's not true. Um, this is uh, Ginger, who was one of our patients, a uh, very long, long time patient, um, and used to go on the underwater treadmill and she talked the whole time, but she did it. And she walked on that underwater treadmill and um, we just loved it. And she would tell you that she was displeased, but she still did it. And we kept her going for a very long time. So um, rehabilitation is not just for dogs. Um, this is her doing a great obstacle course. <laughs> We're keeping her on the obstacle course. So these are partially inflated um, exercise equipment we have, and then she's about to go in the tunnel, which we didn't get that on video, but having cats walk through tunnels um, and things like that can be you know, really beneficial. Usually our cat rehab is 30 minutes long, whereas our dogs will do 50 minutes, but cat minutes are shorter than dog minutes, as we all know. Um, and then the last part that I will talk about, hopefully I'm not going too much over, there's always so much to say about pets, um, is what do we do when the exercises and uh, aren't enough and their mobility is declined? You know, can we still keep them active and mobile? And the answer is yes. So there's a lots of different ways. There's a, a Beco harness, which is um, this dog on the, on the um, I think the left-hand side of your screen, um, this one right here. So this is a, a normal harness that has sort of these stretchy bands connecting the 
the feet to um, the harness and that helps that dog move his leg forward. Um, you can actually change the tension. There's different color uh, bands and depending on the color of the band, you can change the tension. So this can actually not only be an assistive device, but it also can be exercise, which is great. Help them up harnesses have really revolutionized our ability to care for our senior pets who have mobility issues. Um, the reason I like the help them up harness is because as you can see, this is actually supporting underneath the pelvis. Um, a lot of slings go under the belly, which is not the weight bearing axis for dogs. They, they bear weight through their pelvis and their back legs. Uh, so this allows us to really normalize their posture and provide them support. And they come up with all sorts of um, attachments. So you can actually, for like the small dogs, there's a strap so you can connect the, the two sides and, and not have to bend over and it makes your life a lot easier. Um, we also have uh, carts, which are great. I think a lot of people get panicked about a cart um, or a hind limb wheel support because they think that means their dog's not gonna walk anymore or that's gonna lose its mobility. Um, but actually it's really the opposite. I like to think about, you know, for a dog that's not paralyzed, when I'm using a cart, I'm using it more as a walker. So you think about your grandparents or elderly folks um, that use walkers to get around. It allows them to have stability and allows them to remain independent um, without uh, falling and, and without uh, struggling. And so that's really what these um, hind limb support devices do. And there's a few companies out there that um, we use frequently. Um, you can find booties uh, that you put on, on the toes to help them be a little bit more grippy. I don't like those to be long-term solutions. That should really be something you use um, in either in a slippery area in your home or in walks to prevent them from scuffing um, because it changes their ability to sense the ground underneath them. And that's really important uh, for dogs that have maybe a lack of that sensation. Uh, dogs that maybe have some of those neurological changes that we were talking about, maybe have trouble flipping their feet over and end up scuffing or walking on the top of their foot. There are um, socks that we can put on them and little booties that can correct that. Um, toe grips are uh, pretty good. I do love them. I think they're the best product out there in terms of helping for grippiness because um, they don't cover the whole paw. The challenge with them is they do tend to fall off, um, but they're pretty inexpensive. So, you know, it's worth replacing them. Um, so these are all sorts of things that we have available to us to, um, to help us, uh, you know, once the mobility is kind of progressed. We can also modify activity. So um, yoga mats, having those around your home to provide non-slip surfaces for them. Um, also this kitty ramp, I really love this kitty ramp both for its functional use, but also it's a great exercise. So cats that are having trouble getting in and out of the cat litter box, you can use these ramps to put up, uh, up next to the litter box. Um, cat trees, so for cats that really like to climb, but maybe stop climbing their super high tree, you can get the ones that have um, really low to the ground platforms, um, you know, and maybe short distance between the platforms. So you're still encouraging them to get around, um, but it's more at a level that they're able to do. The other big thing is uh, to keep the nail nails trimmed and the paw fur trimmed. Uh, these are essentially that paw fur tends to be like a sock. So if you think about you walking in a sock on a hardwood floor, um, you're going to slip and slide all over the place. And that same thing is happening to the dog. So this is the part that gives them the traction. Um, and so you really want to keep this nice and short so that they have increased traction. Same thing with the nails. If the nails are going over the edge of the paw, which you can't see here, um, it, uh, it, allow, it decreases the contact of these pads and so they, they can slip and slide. <sighs> so um, yes, the, this happens a lot. <laughs> um, I want to sit, but I slide back on the, back on the floor. Um, so we wanna prevent that as much as possible to uh, make it easier for them to get up. That was a lot of information. Um, and I am happy to answer questions, uh, thoughts, concerns anybody has. Um, I appreciate your time and listening and I hope you got some, some helpful information out of this. Thank you so much, Dr. Britt, that was wonderful. So I'm gonna go through, there are a lot of good questions. Great. I'm gonna to get to all, as many as we can. Um, okay, so for dogs and let's talk about cats as well who need to lose weight, um, over what time frame should that be done safely? And um, you know, should we do food first? exercise first order, but at the same time? That is a fantastic question. Um, so the first thing I will say is that weight loss should always be done in, in conjunction with a veterinarian so that it is done safely, someone that's monitoring it. Um, a safe rate of weight loss is one to 2% of their body weight per week. 
And so you wouldn't want more than that. Some, some people have less, um, but one to 2% of their body weight per week. Whether you start with you know, food restriction first or exercise first kind of depends on how functional or how mobile your dog is. So I certainly have had dogs come to us who, you know, have a have really bad arthritis and are having a hard time getting around. And it can be really hard to to get the calories burned to help them lose weight. So we focus more on calorie restriction. Um, I don't ever do one or the other. I think dogs that come to rehab, we either give them some light exercises to do or encourage walking at the same time. Um, but oftentimes what happens is initially we're really focusing on restricting their calories. I will say you have to be careful with just restricting calories because if it's not, that this is why I use a lot of prescription weight loss diets, because if it's not designed to be a weight loss diet, you just restrict calories, you run the risk of depriving them of important nutrients. Um, so these you know, commercial diets are designed to um, have enough, a certain amount of nutrients based on how much you're feeding them. So if you over restrict that, you have potential um, effects on, on their nutrients that they're getting. That's, that's great, great information. Um, okay, um, so this is a good one as well. Um, what vitamins or supplements um, can you give to your pets as they approach senior years to stave off problems? Um, you know, basically, is it a good idea to give Adequan when they're seven, you know, eight or nine, when they're not necessarily experiencing the problems? Like, when do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so two things in terms of vitamins, I, I don't can think of a time really that I've ever prescribed vitamins, especially for dogs. The only time that vitamins play a role is a dog that's on a homemade diet um, or potentially a raw food diet. And that would be something that admittedly that is um, I, a nutrition is a big part of my what I do, but it's also its own specialty. So um, when it comes to balancing a homemade diet, I defer to my my nutritional veterinary nutritionist colleagues. Um, so I barely, very rarely prescribe uh, vitamins because if you're on a commercial um, dog food or cat food, it has everything in it that you need. So you really don't need to do um, that kind of supplementation. Um, in terms of, you know, when to start joint supplements, I don't know that that's as black and white as we would like it to be. Um, Adequan is something uh, that I typically use on a lot of different types of situations. So my senior dogs that are really sore, but I also will use it uh, in my young dogs who have orthopedic disease. And the reason for that is um, something I didn't mention, but most, most of our dogs, sorry about the truck in the background, but if you can hear that, um, most of our dogs uh, have arthritis because of a pre-existing orthopedic injury. So it's a little different than people. And so if I have a dog that has a pre-existing orthopedic injury, something like elbow dysplasia or hip dysplasia, and they're young and they've come to me for management, I typically will start them on Adequan right away. Um, I will do it sort of as the loading dose, um, and we may repeat that later in life. Um, if there's no evidence of arthritis, then it's unlikely that something like omega-3s or Adequan is really going to help. It's probably not going to hurt, but it's unlikely to help. So those, those typical supplements don't prevent um, arthritis from happening. They just slow the progression once it's there. And then are these supplements, um, should they be taken for the duration, you know, for, for the rest of their life? Or is there, we had a question about, you know, is there a time where you would stop them if the, the pet is doing well? Yeah, that's also a great question. And um, it's obviously very dog specific. So um, the recommendations that I make really depend on what I'm seeing in a pet. Um, so I often, you know, depending on how affected they are, might start with one joint supplement and see how they do. Um, if they're, you know, if they have progression a couple years later, I might add an additional supplement. Um, so, you know, I think in, in general, once they get to the point where I feel like their arthritis is helped by joint supplements, they're usually on them for life. And that is also why I like, I'm very picky about what I recommend. And I like to know that there's evidence that they work rather than just kind of the over the counter, um, you know, we just don't know what's in them or if they're even um, uh, effective. So um, for the most part, I would say my senior pets are on these supplements for the rest of their lives. I do get away with decreasing the supplements they use if I can switch them to a joint protective diet for a period of time. Um, but as they progress, some of my real old dogs are on a joint protective diet and joint supplements at the same time. <laughs> And we actually had a question about switching out diets. Like how, how do you do that rotate diets safely and 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, number one answer is always under the guidance of a veterinarian. Um, so definitely have a conversation with your veterinarian about uh, the joint protective diets or weight loss diets. Um, as a general rule of thumb, you want to always transition to a new diet slowly. So I usually recommend about 25% of the new diet with 75% of the old for a couple of days. Um, then you do 50-50 and then 75 new, 25% old. Um, if there's any sort of change in stool consistency, then you'd kind of back off a little bit for a few more days and try to increase it after that. And the reason for that is that um, your gut is full of uh, bacteria that help you digest things. And so if you've been on a particular food, that's what dictates the kind of bacteria that are in your gut. And so if you change it really fast, um, then you end up having uh, your, your gut just doesn't have the bacteria to help digest it and you end up having GI signs. Okay, um, that sounds good. Um, let's see, we have a question about um, can I put our 11-year-old Wheaton in the pool and let him swim with us next to him? <laughs> um, so the 100% the honest answer is that I would want you to have your vet check on your Wheaton and make sure that he was, um, it was safe uh, for him to do that exercise. Um, but swimming is a great exercise for dogs to do um, if they like it and tolerate it, if it doesn't cause too much anxiety. Um, it does help improve range of motion. It helps uh, improve, um, it's very good cardiovascularly. Um, but you'd want to make sure it's safe. So uh, it does cause um, changes the pressure on the heart and lungs. And we already talked about dogs not having as efficient um, lung capacity or uh, their heart pump is not as efficient. So you'd want to make sure that your primary vet or whoever you see uh, feels that it's safe for your dog to do that before you would do it. But yes, yeah, swimming is a great, great exercise. Okay, great. Um, we have a question about how will I know when it's time to get my dog steps to climb onto my couch? Um, he seems to be having a little trouble jumping up. Started in the last six months. He's around 10 or 11. Um, you know, it's again, that that's probably it sounds like maybe he is ready for it now if he's having trouble. Um, you could certainly try to do some of those sit to stand exercises um, to help strengthen the back legs. Um, common reasons that a dog has trouble jumping is either going to be his back um, or his back legs if he's having trouble jumping up. So um, having those things checked out, um, make sure there's nothing significantly wrong um, and no reason not to do these exercises um, would be my first step. And then once you have the all clear. Um, certainly doing some of those um, sit to stands. You can also have him hold the posture where he puts his front legs up on the couch and just holds that posture for a little bit. You can do a couple repetitions of that. Um, and those are things that can help him um, be able to jump up onto the couch. Uh, but certainly I'm never I'm always going to be in favor of stairs um, because that's the safest way for your pet to get up on the on the couch, especially if they're having trouble. I, um, I had an older cat and then my dog was younger, much younger, but he, so I had the steps for the cat and then my dog started using them. So I got bigger stairs. So I'm like, if he likes them, you know, it couldn't hurt and hopefully will you know, exactly. Exactly. I find stairs, I've never, to be honest, I'll, full disclosure, I've never trained one of my own pets to do it. Um, when my old golden got old, I just picked him up and, you know, I, I changed my whole life. So my bed was up against the wall and he was between me and the wall so he couldn't fall off. And I just picked him up and put him up there. So I've never personally trained a pet to do that. I do know from what my clients have said is that it can be challenging. You, you have, what I've heard is there's basically two types of pets, the ones that love it and learn it right away way and the ones that just will never do it and so um that that's been my anecdotal experience um with the pet stairs <laughs> okay um let's see so we have a question about a 10 year old mini schnauzer high whose hind legs shake after running or exertion um is this a sign of osteoarthritis or something neurological and Oh have? man, I just had this conversation with one of my colleagues today. I have to openly admit that leg shaking is my least favorite symptom. Uh, it's so vague and can be really hard to figure out. It can be associated with pain. It can be associated with weakness. It can be associated with anxiety. Um, so for that one, I would really have somebody have somebody check your dog out um, because unfortunately, it's again, it's not very specific. Um, so it could be related to a lot of different things. Okay, great. Um, there's, um, how can I help my dog who has been diagnosed with advanced dementia? But I think that's, you know, the cognitive decline. So if the body is okay and you want to keep them active, but how do yeah. you? 
Yeah, I have to say that's one of the toughest things. And, um, you know, in our in our field of, of rehab medicine, again, we deal with a lot of geriatric pets and we're seeing it more and more because our pets are living longer. Um, one thing that we do know that is one of the biggest um, stimulated, stimulation of the brain, which is really what you're trying to do, is olfactory, so sniffing. Uh, so um, having... Um, uh, like puzzles, food puzzles that you can put uh, food in, hiding food around your house, um, any sort of food game, something that stimulates them um, to really, uh, uh, you know, look for that food and, and stimulate that olfactory sense. When you're on walks, um, we're all guilty of, you know, stop sniffing, let's go, I've got to get to work. Um, take set aside some of the walks to allow them to spend that time sniffing, because again, that's going to stimulate them. Um, and stimulate that uh, part of their brain. There is an over-the-counter food uh, by Purina, which uh, has had very good results. Uh, it's called um, Bright Minds. I always get confused. One is prescription, one is over-the-counter. I, I think the over-the-counter is Bright Minds. Um, it has medium chain fatty acids in it that have been shown to help cognitive function. And so uh, I've had a lot of clients switch to that food um, and had a lot of success. I will say it's high in calories, so um, you have to be cautious because it can cause weight gain. Um, but that's one of the options. Um, and then also just trying, you know, little things like when you um, go out to potty, if you want to put those cavalettis, um, you know, the, the poles, if the dog always goes the same direction, if they have to go out this hallway or down this particular way, um, putting things in that pathway for them to, to step over um, will stimulate them and uh, keep them thinking about where their feet, feet are. There are some medications, fortunately, that have been very helpful um, that would obviously have to be prescribed by a veterinarian, um, but either your vet or neuro the neurology service at uh, AMC is actually um, quite good at dealing with this as well. So as it becomes progressive, there are medications that have, that have helped with it. Um, so it's, it's a tough one because they're, you know, like the question said, it's, it's their brain, their body is okay, but they're just not quite there mentally. And it can be really challenging um, both for an owner and, and for caretakers. Definitely. Um... Hey, are any of these therapies used on senior rabbits? Um, oh man, yes, actually they are. Um, and so you may know that the AMC has a wonderful exotics department and they actually refer quite a few patients to us. Um, Adequan can be used on rabbits. Um, Anti-inflammatories can be used on rabbits. Um, we actually, we have quite a few patients that have come for rehab. Um, we also had a guinea pig that came for rehab. Um, so yes, uh, these same principles apply. Um, you have to be careful and I always defer to our exotics teams in terms of dosing and um, you know monitoring these things. But yes, there are um, similar treatments available for rabbits. Right, okay. Um, and then this, this is good as well. Um, does a dog's vision change over time, which you know it does, and, and what can you do in terms of exercising a dog as, as their vision changes, and also um, your hearing as well, so just. Yeah, that's, um, that's great. Um, so, you know, I think this similar things apply. So one of the things that we try to recommend for um, people who own dogs who have poor vision or have lost vision is not to rearrange your furniture or kind of keep things in the same way so they know um, where things are. Um, being a guide for them to do these exercises. You know, we, we actually have a patient right now who's um, coming to us because he has difficulty um, sitting down and he's also blind. And um, I, I tell his owner all the time that this dog is my inspiration because he learned how to do the underwater treadmill and the Cavalettis and the sit to stands and he can't see, he just has to have me, I have to guide him with my voice um, and my hands and he does all these things and, and learned it amazingly. So um, it is possible to do these things. It just takes a little bit more patience. You wanna make sure you're rewarding um, with a treat immediately uh, when they do the exercise that you wanna do, but it, it's definitely possible. Great, okay. Um, and this is something that we hear about a lot now is bone broth. Um, do you have any thoughts on that or is that a good supplement for an older dog? <laughs> yeah, I do. I don't know much about it. I do have uh, folks that put their dogs on it. Um, I don't, I don't know. I admittedly don't know a lot about that um, or, or if there's any evidence about it or not, but I, I, I would have to look into that. Okay. All right. Um, and then we did have a question. I know that you don't do acupuncture yourself, but that, um, someone was asking, you know, said that their Sheltie would freak out. Like, how does that how do, is that done? Yeah. 
Um, so it, it is a very individual practice. Um, and so there's a lot of things that go into assessing a dog and whether they're tolerated or not. Um, there's some questions that are asked about, you know, what their underlying personality is. Um, you know, there's sort of um, fire and metal and air. And so they're, you know, looking at that and, and based on the type of dog that you have and their personality, um, they'll use that. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people who say their animal will freak out actually do quite well. Um, there's some calming points that they can use um, to help them acclimate to it. Um, and so, you know, if we worry about it, we'll often say like, let's just try one session and see how they do. Um, and then also there are many people in this area that do acupuncture at home. Sometimes dogs tolerate that better. Um, personally, I've had acupuncture done myself and it doesn't really, um, it's like an initially like, oh, that was a, you know, weird feeling, but it's, it's really not painful. And um, the majority of our patients tolerate it very well. Okay, great. Um, and then let's do one more question um, about massaging here. Yeah. So if that's helpful. And we actually do have a video on our YouTube page um, with, uh, you know, from one of our events with massage. So you can check that out, but we'd love to have you talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually, um, I think if it's the same video you're talking about, it's my mentor, Dr. Alvarez. Um, and she does a lovely, it's on YouTube. You can find that and, and talks about how to do gentle massage. That is absolutely a wonderful thing to do for your pet. Um, you, you, it would be very hard to do massage wrong um, because, um, you know, the dogs usually tell you if they like it or not. And so if they're not responding well, then they're probably uncomfortable. Um, but massage is a great thing to do. Some of the common areas that I like to recommend would be their triceps. So kind of behind their arm, the same place that um, we, you know, right here behind you, it's a, it's a weight bearing muscle and it does a lot of work for them. So massaging there, um, massaging along the neck, running of the spine, which is just kind of making this C shape and running down the spine of your dog. Um, you can do it on their um, quads and, and uh, back legs. And yeah, that's a lovely thing to do. Um, and it's, it's certainly, um, you know, easy to do. And, and probably the best resource would be that video from Dr. Alvarez. That's great. And we also have, um, Dr. Alvarez did a, a workout, dog workout, which many of those exercises. So find that on our YouTube as well. Um, so this was really wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Britt. And thank you all so much for joining us. I know it's a really difficult time and we just appreciate you, you know, spending your evening, a little bit of your evening with us. So thank you all. And this will be, um, we will send out a link. So if you want to watch it tomorrow, um, thank you, Kimberly, for, for everything too. But yeah, thank you everyone. And thank you, Dr. Britt. And everyone have of a course. Take Thank care. you guys. And I saw a few clients out there. It's good to see you on there.